हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू यू जी सी ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर रजनीश रंजन डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट एक्सपर्ट एंड वी पी स्काईमेंट टूडे आई एम गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट द मॉड्यूल डिजास्टर रिलीफ एंड रिहेबिलिटेशन द रेशनल बिहाइंड दिस मॉड्यूल दैट इज डिजास्टर रिलीफ एंड रिहेबिलिटेशन फॉर्म्स इंपॉर्टेंट कॉम्पोनेंट्स ऑफ डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट द फेज ऑफ डिजास्टर रिलीफ प्रोवाइड्स essential requirements for survival of the affected community relief must be provided in a humane manner recognizing the dignity of individuals and their right to post disaster relief disaster rehabilitation is part of post disaster recovery and is a long term strategy that must help in the mainstreaming of disaster risk reduction efforts into developmental planning The main learning objectives of this module is to get acquaintance with the importance of providing disaster relief the corresponding international laws and guidelines standards and humanitarian principles to understand the concept of disaster relief including what all constitute disaster relief aid who are the providers and distributors of disaster aid to understand the concept of rehabilitation and its importance in developmental goal so now let's discuss first about disaster relief disaster relief is the process of responding to a disaster event that has led to adverse impact on the lives of the affected community to alleviate the sufferings and providing humanitarian aid relief refers to the provision of appropriate essential services to the affected community in a timely manner based on the initial rapid assessment of the immediate requirements after disasters the evacuation of people from their residence in cases of risk of the occurrence of disasters and thereby provisions of emergency services including temporary shelter and immediate needs like food clothing non food items etc they are also considered under disaster relief in the alleviation of sufferings of the affected community the phase of disaster relief is usually considered up to 6 months from the occurrence of the incident it includes the immediate aftermath when essentials are required and extends up to the rehabilitation phase of disaster response or recovery sometimes overlapping with it disaster recovery needs to be synchronized with rehabilitation and reconstruction efforts in order to bring about quicker and effective recovery of the affected community the following figures indicates the disaster recovery cycle with an indicative timeline of the steps post disaster event and corresponding unit cost of materials The first facet of disaster recovery is the relief that starts with the disaster event and extends till stability is reached that is usually about 6 months post devastating event This is followed by the rehabilitation and reconstruction phases that starts post some stability is reached proper needs assessment is an important component of these phases and thereby the requirement for stability arises international laws pertaining to disaster response there are international laws that necessitate disaster relief the international humanitarian rights law indicates that it is the duty of the state to protect and to fulfill human rights of their people within the administrative jurisdiction of the state the key sources of the law includes the international covenants on civil and political rights and economic social and cultural rights 1966 the convention on prevention and punishment of genocide 1948 committee on the elimination of discrimination against women 1979 regional idp conventions and international customary laws including jus cogens norms the key provisions of the international human rights law 
are political rights that includes right to life, freedom from torture, freedom of movements, etc. The economic and social rights include right to food, housing, clothing, health, livelihoods, adequate standard of living, etc. These are also to be provided to the citizens of nation as per the constitution. Humanitarian assistance thus becomes an obligation on the part of state as legal space is present for individuals to claim right to humanitarian assistance. Based on the experience of various agencies in disaster response, there is a set of laws, rules and principles dealing with international disaster response termed as IDRL. It aims to improve international humanitarian framework covering humanitarian assistance to the affected population. The IDRL applies to both the state and non-state actors and are based on treaties regional, international and bilateral, non-binding UN resolutions, non-binding guidelines for domestic facilitation and regulation of international disaster relief and initial recovery assistance 2007 as well as the International Law Commission's draft articles on protection of persons in the event of disaster. The key provisions of such laws ensure sovereignty of the state as a key feature of international disaster assistance and attribute the primary responsibility for all aspects of humanitarian assistance within its territory onto the state. The IDRL also highlights the importance rather than right of humanitarian assistance in disaster context. Humanitarian response to disasters is based on four key pillars. Humanity, number one, human sufferings must be addressed wherever it is found protecting lives, health and ensuring respect for human beings. Number two, neutrality, humanitarian actors must not be biased or take any side in hostilities or be engaged in controversies of political, racial, religious or ideological nature. Impartiality carried out on the basis of need alone, giving priority to the most urgent cases and making no distinction on the basis of nationality, race, gender, religion, caste or political opinions. Next is operational independence that is autonomous from political, economic, military or other objectives that any actors may hold with regards to areas where humanitarian action is implemented. It becomes as extremely important to respond to disaster situations, upkeeping the pillars of humanitarian principles for an effective, equitable and just disaster relief. Now let us talk about disaster relief materials and guidelines. The basic ideology of disaster aid is to alleviate sufferings of disasters affected population and to provide them materials and support for ensuring their survival without affecting their dignity. In order to provide an effective needs oriented response strategy, certain minimum standards are suggested for humanitarian relief. That has been taken from the SPEAR project 2011 and 2013. These standards form for humanitarian relief are recognized as sphere standards. The following are essential constituents of disaster reliefs. Participation of disaster affected community in the assessment, design, implementation and evaluation of assistance programs. Initial assessment on the parameters of threats to life, dignity, health and livelihoods in order to determine the requirement and nature of the response. Response when needs are unmet and the relevant authorities in the area are unable or unwilling to respond to protection and assistance of the affected population under their jurisdiction. Equitable and impartial assistance based on the vulnerability and needs of individuals or groups affected by disaster. Monitoring effectiveness of response 
and changes incorporated to improve the assistance program or phasing out as required. Evaluation of humanitarian action intended to draw lessons for improving practice and policy and enhance accountability. Ensuring aid workers competencies and responsibilities including qualifications, attitude and experience to plan and effectively implement the appropriate program. Supervision, management and support of personnel to ensure effective disaster relief. Based on these considerations, few standards are set for ensuring minimum requirements of water, sanitation, food, nutrition, shelter and health care to satisfy basic rights of life with dignity in the disaster affected community. Water supply, sanitation and hygiene promotion is also a very important component. All hygiene facilities and resources provided must reflect the vulnerabilities needs and preferences of the affected population and the users are involved in the management and maintenance of the facilities. All the affected communities must have safe and equitable access to sufficient quantity of water for drinking, cooking and personal or domestic hygiene along with the adequate facilities to collect, store and use required sufficient quantities of water. Water provided must be palatable and of sufficient quality to be drunk and used for, for other uses without significant risk to health. Adequate number of all day safe and rapidly accessible toilets preferably close to their dwellings designed, constructed and maintained in a hygienic manner. Disaster affected population to be sufficiently aware of vector control measures to prevent risk to health or well-being. Disaster affected, affected population should have the access to solid waste management disposal facilities. Proper drainage arrangements must be ensured in order to avoid the problem of land erosion or the condition of water logging due to disaster events. Food security, nutrition and food aid. Response to provide food supplies must be respectful keeping in view the local context of food preferences, access, impact of disaster events on the current and future food security meeting nutrition needs of the affected population sector. If the affected population is at risk of malnutrition, the appropriate assistance program must be based on the cause, type, degree and extent of malnutrition keeping in mind macronutrients deficiencies. Affected people should have the access to adequate food and non-food items of appropriate quality in order to ensure their survival prevent erosion of assets and upholds the affected person's dignity with protection and support of primary production mechanism of food and unrestricted access to markets. To ensure that the affected people have income generation, employment opportunities to generate fair remuneration and contribute towards food security. Rations for food distribution must be designed to bridge gaps between population's requirement and their own food resources. Ensuring that food is stored, prepared and consumed in a safe and appropriate manner at the household and community level. Shelter, settlement and non-food items. Under this, existing shelter and settlement solutions must be prioritized through a quick disposal system to facilitate returning of community dwellers to their original dwellings with improved hygiene and safe conditions through appropriate physical planning. Any construction activity undertaken must be in accordance with the local safe building practices and must maximize livelihood opportunities and minimizing adverse environmental impacts with respect to material sourcing and construction techniques. Disaster affected people must possess sufficient clothing, blankets, bedding to ensure dignity, safety and well-being with access to items of personal hygiene like soap, etc. Cooking and eating utensils, 
cooking facilities including fuel and artificial lighting. Disaster affected households in need of maintenance or construction or safe use of their shelter must have access to necessary tools and equipments. Now, let us talk about the health services. Standardized health services following accepted protocols and guidelines delivered by trained competent health workers and consistent supply of essential medicines and consumables must be accessible to all coordinated by the responding agencies. Primary healthcare services must be kept free for disaster victims during disasters. The delivery of health services must be guided by collection, analysis, interpretation and utilization of relevant public health data. Essential health services must be prioritized to address the main causes of excess morbidity and mortality following disaster event, including diagnostic facilities, focusing on newborn and children and addressal of injuries to prevent avoidable morbidity, mortality and disability and prevention reduction of mental health problems and associated impaired functioning and prevent chronic health conditions and like that. Corresponding information relating to the excess morbidity and mortality through communicable diseases and the availability of treatment healthcare must be shared with all affected people. Prevention of vaccine preventable diseases must be ensured by health agencies once the disaster situation stabilizes. Now, Reproductive health services of the minimum, minimum initial services package MISP must be made available and accessible on priority during the onset of emergencies including access to minimum set of HIV prevention, treatment care and support and comprehensive reproductive health as the situation stabilizes. Now, let us have an idea about the key components of disaster relief. Friends, post disaster reliefs or aids are usually arrived in the form of funds, foods, medicines, equipments, building materials, technical assistance or debt relief. Relief activities usually include the provision of food, medicines and health care, safe drinking water and sanitation, temporary shelters, sense of security and psychological and social first aid. Relief workers focus is on meeting the immediate needs of the affected individuals and community. The affected area receives disaster aid from domestic and foreign sources. Such disaster aid is then distributed among the affected community. The process of raising a request for disaster aid involves flash appeals by certain agencies from on behalf of from or on behalf of the disaster affected nation and the corresponding pledges and disbursement of disaster aid in response to the appeals. Flash appeals includes identifying needs of the affected community, coordinating a strategic response in order to satisfy the needs followed by publicizing funds and materials need in order to carry forward the response to disaster events along with inventorying, relief and early recovery projects. Flash appeals are generally made by the government of the disaster affected nation. Irrespective of the appeals made by the administration of the affected area to help victims of the extreme event, any NGO may also help, may also make such appeal. If the disaster event affects a very large number of population, the United Nations UN could also make an appeal to the nations and potential donors across the globe on behalf of the disaster community or the country. A pledge is a non-binding promise that is often very general and could also be a ministerial statement. It could also include emergency relief and reconstruction aid. Donor agencies cannot generally give away funding or any other form of aid without terms of reference or contract that specifies the utilization specifying its intent and objectives. 
disaster aid is the fund materials towards disaster relief that is actually released by the donor agencies to the disaster affected nations. Agencies in disaster aid and relief distribution. There are numerous agencies involved in the provision of disaster aid as well as distribution to the affected country community. For any disaster event, the very first responders are the local people and agencies. They show enormous solidarity with the affected community and offer immediate assistance including food, shelter, clothing, cash, labor and are usually both providers and distributors of disaster aid. They also provide crucial psychological support. The domestic respondents would also include the friends and relatives of disaster affected people who might be residing outside the affected areas or people in the neighboring areas and other business, non-business organizations in the nearby non-affected areas. The local government and NGOs are usually the next set of responders. If the disaster event exceeds the capacity of the local government to respond to the situation, further help could be sought from agencies like the State Disaster Response Force, the National Disaster Response Force, Indian Army, Navy, Air Force, international NGOs, etc. In order to ensure better coordination between the responding agencies, interagency groups are being promoted. The National Disaster Management Authority NDMA, and the Ministry of Home Affairs MHA, have also come up with guidelines for incident response system to provide standard operating procedures and roles and responsibilities allocation for the local government to coordinate response. It moves from a people oriented to a process driven response strategy documenting every step in the disaster response and aids in making better decisions with respect to ensuring effective response and immediate disaster relief. Now let us talk about the cash. Cash is the most effective disaster relief. Disaster aid consists of immediate assistance in various forms. Responding agencies opine that cash is the most useful donation that could be donated by people or agency interested in helping the affected community, taken from FEMA 2011. The flexibility offered by disaster aid in the form of cash, especially to the responding agency, helps in a culturally, nutritionally and environmentally acceptable support and, is, and it helps to stimulate the local economies mainly by not competing with goods from the local market and does not have transportation, shipping costs associated with other forms of donation. Now talking about the mechanism of funds or aid dispersal. At present, there is no central agency functioning to channelize funds post disaster event. Donor governments usually disperse funds through UN agencies, regional multilateral organizations and or domestic NGOs. Bilateral aid is often sent directly to the affected nation's government. Donor agencies could also channelize funds through multi-donor trust fund administered by the World Bank, thus preventing multiple transactions each with its own set of objectives. Usually, there is a gap between the amount of aid placed by donors and the amount of aid that is actually released for the utilization to responding agencies, taken from Paul 2011. Foreign private donations are usually channeled through NGOs and charities. Thus, in the case of a flooding incident in one part of a country, responding NGO with international presence would collect donations funds from various locations across the globe and inform its office near to the affected location the amount which it has, it has been able to collect internationally. Thereby, the local office would know the maximum available funds and make necessary arrangements for disaster relief without the necessity of physical presence of funds in order to provide quick response. Most NGOs in developing nations largely depend upon the external support for disaster assistance 
and could thereby be considered as distributors rather than providers. Media plays a key role in the mobilization of funds and also makes impact on the way how disaster effects are portrayed. It would be easier to mobilize funds with the mobilization campaign focusing on individual victims rather than an entire area being affected. Funds mobilization campaign of NGOs could be observed focusing on the individual impacts, preferably children. The phenomenon of psychosocial numbing is attributed to such funds mobilization campaigns which indicates that people become increasingly insensitive to events that impacts large number of people but respond strongly to single identifiable victims. Friends, now let us talk about disaster rehabilitation. The rehabilitation phase starts after the completion or near completion of immediate response stage when order begins to restore and, and, and an estimate of losses damages due to disaster could roughly be assessed. Rehabilitation may be defined as an overall dynamic and immediate strategy of institutional reform and reinforcement, reconstruction and improvement of infrastructure and services aimed towards the support of the initiatives and actions of the affected population in the political, economic and social domains as well as reiteration of sustainable development taken from NDMA 2016. The efforts on post-disaster reconstruction and rehabilitation that are important facets of disaster recovery are considered as opportunities to build back better. They are seen as enablers for mainstreaming disaster risk reduction efforts and embedding risk reduction into developmental measures for building resilient communities. Rehabilitation can be classified into four categories, physical rehabilitation, that is reconstruction of physical infrastructure which includes land use planning, micro and macro zonation, retrofitting, disaster resilient cropping pattern, water shed management etc. It also includes the aspects of relocation, social rehabilitation. This includes restoration of social structures in areas and may emphasize upon the vulnerable groups like children elderly, women and marginalized communities. Economic rehabilitation that includes livelihood restoration and business continuity so that income generation is restored with particular emphasis on sustainable employment or income generation. Psychological rehabilitation this includes stress management with particular focus on post traumatic stress disorder. Now, Rehabilitation programs must include the understanding developed over time about the systematic causes and the long term consequences of the disaster event taken from Niazi. The vulnerability of the community that was exacerbated by the exposure to the disaster event must be addressed in the state of disaster management by mainly addressing the altered poverty levels emerging after the disaster. Immediate relief and reconstruction activities including physical rehabilitation provides immediate boost to the local economy. When such physical measures are supported by the improvement in land, water and environmental resource management with improvement of economic opportunities, the vulnerabilities could be addressed effectively. Thus, ultimately improving the quality of life and disasters therefore providing the window of opportunity during the rehabilitation phase to gradually introduce to the community concepts like better construction practice, rainwater harvesting, improved sanitation, sewerage and drainage that thereby promoting better management of resources. The following figure indicates the steps from disaster to sustainable, to sustainable development. Rehabilitation must therefore be undertaken, taking into consideration the detailed socio-economic profile of the affected community and risk assessments with monitoring and evaluation frameworks in place. Past interventions that is pre-disaster development related schemes and programs 
and post disaster interventions must be monitored and analyzed to avoid creating or exacerbating risks. A community led process in coordination with local staff would ensure proper planning and implementation of rehabilitation programs. The local government thus plays a very important role in the rehabilitation of disaster affected community. Friends, now talk let us talk about PDNA post disaster need assessment and rehabilitation. Post disaster needs assessment is a prerequisite for planning disaster rehabilitation taken from IFRC 2012. A detailed needs assessment would bring about the requirement for interventions at various levels. Based on these identified requirements, rehabilitation strategy is prepared that considers the following the nature of disaster and the resultant type, scale and extent of damages, proper stakeholder analysis, the coordination between various agencies involved in rehabilitation, risk management to ensure new risks are not built into the community during the rehabilitation or developmental phase and focusing on disaster reduction efforts, gender sensitive redevelopment, environmental and other resource considerate redevelopment in the form of interventions that bring about sustainable improvement in the quality of life. Balancing needs with available resources are critical in the rehabilitation stage. Relief stage might attract large international and national aid while the rehabilitation stage might not garner the same amount of attention. Thus, prioritization of investment would be a key requirement for effective rehabilitation. The bottlenecks for rehabilitation includes fund sources and distribution materials for reconstruction, livelihood diversification or resource management, equipments and tools for facilitation of reconstruction and rehabilitation, energy or power for critical infrastructure and facilitate economic rebuilding of affected community, land especially post devastating disasters like landslides, floods, soil, sea or ozone etc., human resources due to casualty or out migration, data, reliable information could be problematic due to the decentralized work environment and lack of interagency coordination, administrative structures and organizations due to excess work pressure on public sector. So, at the end let us summarize this module. Disaster relief refers to the provision of appropriate essentials to the affected community in a timely manner based on an initial rapid assessment of the immediate requirements in post disaster phase. It includes the immediate aftermath when essentials are required and extends up to the rehabilitation phase of disaster response recovery, sometimes overlapping with it. It is observed that cash is the most effective form of disaster aid to the responding agencies as it, as it enables a contextual response. The primary responsibility for all aspects of humanitarian assistance within its territory like initiation, organization, coordination and implementation is with the state. Agencies responding to disasters bear in mind the humanitarian principles of neutrality, impartiality, humanity and operational independence while responding to disasters. There are certain standards expected in disaster relief that are developed based on the experience of responding agencies. Post disaster rehabilitation phase starts immediately post the response stage when order begins to be restored and an estimate of losses damages due to the disaster could roughly be assessed. Post disaster needs assessment is a prerequisite for planning disaster rehabilitation. Rehabilitation programs must include the understanding developed over time about the systematic causes and the long term consequences of the disaster event on the disaster affected community area and aim to mainstream disaster reduction into the development process with the goal of sustainable development. I hope you have understood the concept of disaster relief and rehabilitation module. See you next time. Thank you very much.